Our help is in the name of the Lord who has made heaven and earth, which keepeth truth for ever, and who never forsaketh the works of his own hands. Amen. Congregation, we continue by singing Psalter 34, the stanzas 1 and 3. 34, stanzas 1 and 3. I love the Lord, his strength is mine. He is my God, I trust his grace. My fortress high, my shield divine, my savior and my hiding place. 1 and 3 of 34. Do confession of faith at the Church of All Ages and all places with the Apostolic Creed. You can find it in the back of the Psalter. I believe in God the Father Almighty, Maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, I believe in holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Selection of praise you can find in again in the book of the Psalms and this time Psalm 117 Psalm 117 a selection of praise There are reading God's holy and infallible word these two verses Praise the Lord all ye nations praise him all ye people For his merciful kindness is great toward us and all the truth endureth forever Praise ye the Lord let us now turn unto the Lord and pray and ask for his blessing also upon this second service. Great God of heaven and of earth, we come before thee also in our second service before thy great throne. Thou hast brought it once more together around thy word to hear what thou hast to say unto the churches. Thou speakest all through the ages from the beginning of the world until now, in different ways, but the same word. Whether it was spoken in the past or written in these days, yea, thou still speakest through thy servants also in this day. And may these services be blessed by thee, because without thy blessing it is all in vain. Then we worship, but it is not unto thy glory. Then the preaching might be proclaimed, but it is not for salvation of men and sinners. Other than bless thy word, us in this day. When we have a second servant thinking about the name Jesus, what does it mean? What is his work? What does it mean for us? Lord, and it is so necessary to have that name 
not only upon our lips, but also in our heart. Not only the name itself, but also his person, revealed into our hearts by faith. And that is the way how thou revealest thyself to people, by saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And, O Lord, then we have to say that there are so many saviors in this world. Christ said it already, Behold, here is the Christ, and there is the Christ. But if they come to you, don't listen to them, because they are not the real Christ. I have foretold you. In the last days there shall be many that say here or there. But it is not the real one. Lord, that's what we hear this afternoon as well about that Savior, that there's only one way of salvation, and that those who try to seek their salvation in any other way, in any other Savior, that they don't trust with all their heart in the one true Savior, Jesus Christ. And that means that they are still forever lost. Lord, if we think about it, then we should be trembling. To examine our hearts, do we truly believe this Messiah? Do we truly believe that one Savior for sinners? Elder, then give all that is needed also in this second service to proclaim that word faithfully from the Scriptures to support it by the Scriptures. The Lord, and we beg of thee also to have thy Spirit, to have it from on high. Then we ask thee for that blessing upon our lives. With the hearing of the word. But also after this service, Lord, then go with us. Whatever we, way we go. We ask you for all the church members, whether here or listening along, or maybe listen at a later time, or not being able to gather with us. Thou knowest all their circumstances. Help them out and through. Give them all that is needed. Show thy favor also to them. Forgive our many false sins. Come in our midst, O Lord. Be with thy spirit in our midst. Will thou then as a risen Christ also be here with thy power. Thou hast said all power is given unto me. That means also the power in preaching. Also the power to convert sinners. We ask it all in the name of thy Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. We will now continue by singing Psalter 112, the stanzas 1 and 4. 112, the stanzas 1 and 4. Before thy people I confess the wonders of thy righteousness. Thou knowest, Lord, that I have made thy great salvation known. Thy truth and faithfulness displayed, thy loving kindness shown. 1 and 4 of 112.
now read his main scripture reading the gospel of Matthew you can find it in chapter 1 the verses 18 through 25 where it is very specifically about the birth of Christ and the giving of his name and in relation to that we will continue with our series on the Heidelberg Catechism Lord's Day 11 where it very specifically speaks about his name Jesus so the scripture reading for this second service is Matthew 1 the verses 18 through 25 and after that we read Heidelberg Catechism Lord's Day 11 the question and answers there first Matthew 1 beginning at verse 18 till the end of the chapter now we're reading God's holy and infallible word the following words now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this way when as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph before they came together she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away pri privately. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. For he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which had been interpreted God with us. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife, and knew her not, till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and called his name Jesus. And this name Jesus we find in the back of our Psalter in Lord's Day 11. And then we have two different questions. Question 29 and question 30. Question 29 is as following. Why is the Son of God called Jesus, that is, Savior? Answer. Because he saves us and delivers us from our sins, and likewise because we ought not to seek, neither can find salvation in any other. Question 30. Do then such believe in Jesus, the only Savior, who seek their salvation and welfare of saints, of themselves, or anywhere else? Answer. They do not. For though they boast of him in words, yet in deeds they deny Jesus the only deliverer and Savior. For one of these two things must be true, that either Jesus is not a complete Savior, or that they who by a true faith receive the Savior must find all things in him necessary for their salvation. So far are two questions and answers of our Heidelberg Catechism which is also the text for the sermon in this second service. Let me begin to ask you a question, friends, congregation. We all have a name. What name do we have? What is the importance of our name? Have you ever thought about that? Some people do have a very beautiful name. You, you hear the name, you say, wow, that's, that's a beautiful name. Or did you have a name and, and you kind of, I'm not too sure about the name that I would give it to my child. There's names that are very easy to pronounce. But other names are very difficult to pronounce. And I think, for example, some Korean students, when they pronounce their names, I try to follow them, but I forget after three seconds. You can have a name that is very American, like Ryan, or you can have a more biblical name like Jacob. But what is the meaning of our name? Have you thought about that? Maybe you have a name that might mean exalting God like Judah. Or you have a name that is wisher of peace like Solomon. And another question is, is this, do names have impact? Yes. If I would tell you this name, Google, what comes in mind? I believe this, it's a mighty company a lot of money, a lot of power, and everybody uses it. 
So we see names have impact even in our days. But what is the most important name? Well, that's the name Jesus, and that's what we hear today. The impact of the name Jesus, that's our, our theme for this service. And then we have two different points. The first one is, it is the Savior's name. And the second point is, it is about the Savior's work. So the impact of the name Jesus, our theme, it is the Savior's name, and it is about the Savior's work. The Savior's name. We are explaining in our Lord's Days the Apostolic Creed. As you have seen, the, the, it is divided in three different parts. First God the Father in creation, then God the Son and salvation, and God the Holy Spirit and sanctification. And we are in our second part of the Son. We've heard the previous Lord's Days about God the Father, creation, maintenance, continuation. And now we turn in a Lord's Day to the Son of God, Jesus Christ. In the coming Lord's Days, we will think about different names given to Him, different titles given. In this Lord's Day, it's about the name Jesus. The next Lord's Day is about the name or title Christ. And then the Lord's Day after, it's about the Son of God and Lord. And now we turn to our first name, the name Jesus. And let's read question 29 once again. Why is the Son of God called Jesus that is a Savior? We speak here about the Son of God. Who is that? I think you, you probably know the answer. It's the second person in the Trinity. We have three different persons, and the second of the three is the Son of God. And the Son of God is very necessary for salvation. That's what he said about himself. The hour is coming, and now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that shall hear shall live. John 5.25 it means this Son of God calls sinners to life. It's an important person. But what is now a very personal name of this Son of God? Well, the name Jesus. And when did he get his name? Was it from all eternity that the Father said already Jesus to the one that was next to him? No. It is thought by the Father already from eternity, but it's only given in time. We hear Angel Gabriel, what we read in our passage. Come unto Joseph in a dream, and he tells, Thou shalt call his name Jesus. So it shows it's not a name given by any other human, not by his father, earthly father and mother, but it's by God the Father that gives this name. And this name Jesus comes actually from the Hebrew language, the language of our Old Testament. It's the same as the word Joshua. You would you pronounce it in Hebrew like Yeshua? Do you hear it? Jesus is, is more a Greek translation of the name. For example, we read in the Bible, He showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord. There's exactly the name Jesus, we can say. But what is the meaning of this name? Well, literally it means Jehovah is salvation. And that's exactly the picture of Joshua, the next leader after Moses. What do we see? Well, he brings the people out of the wilderness into the land of Canaan. He, as it were, God shows salvation through Joshua to bring them into the promised land. But why is the name given to Jesus Christ? Well, he is Jehovah. He is God. He may say, I, Jehovah, am salvation. He's also the salvation of God's people. The angel gave also the reason in our passage we read, For he shall save his people from their sins. So the name of Jesus is actually who he is. May I ask you myself as well, have we heard the voice of the Son of God? We have heard it before. Why do we ask it? Well, those that hear will live. So we need to know about this. As we are born, we are dead. And, and Jesus Christ said, those that are spiritually dead, they shall hear the Son of God, the voice of him, and they shall live. Yes, it's those that live in their sins and misery, those that are away from God. No, they don't see that. They don't enjoy anything of God. They enjoy their own life. May I ask you, therefore, do you know about the voice of the Son of God? Then the word did power. Then things began to change under the sermons. 
you began to listen different. No, the sermon was no longer about my neighbor, about that lady that is sitting in church that needs to listen now. It's not no longer about my son that is not listening at home. And yes, the preacher says something about him. No, it's about me. Now he knows about me what's going on. It's like sometimes that I'm alone in church. Yes, there are so many people sitting there, but it's only focused on me now. It seems that the preacher knows everything about my heart. The things I think, the things I've done, the things I've said in the past week. And he just reveals it all from the pulpit. How can that be? Has he checked on me in the past week what I did? No. But it's God that tells through the preacher what is living in my heart. He said, as it were, I'm standing before the throne of God and the books are opened and revealed what is there. And then God, through the preacher, speaks directly to me. What more? Now it's not only that, but also that certain events that are spoken of are very important and become more personal. Then I realize suddenly the need of the birth of Christ. That the Son of God, being in all the glory, that He came down from heaven to not have a pleasant life, but to work and to suffer. He asks you again, do you hear the voice of the Son of God? Have you recognized Him? And do we still think that here is standing a preacher? Oh yes, He explains very nicely the Word of God. He does a good job, but that's it. Is that it? That's the case, dear friends, if you have never had that experience that there is God speaking, I have to say to you, we are dead in sin. Seek the Lord and to ask him, Lord, may I hear thy voice. Will thou open my heart for thee? Yes, the name Jesus, that's the name of the Savior. But what is a Savior? Well, well that's someone that saves from sin. That's what we see in our answer 29. Because he saves us and delivers us from our sins, he saves. And to save someone has two sides. It has a twofold meaning. It's to save from something and to save unto something. It has a negative side to rescue from danger and it has a positive side. Let's think about the negative side first. Let's say you, you, you go on, on the road. And you suddenly hear a cry there in the water and you see a boy drowning and he's crying out, help me. And then you save him out of the water. You get him from the water on the shore. The boy is saved from drowning and danger. Well, the same is kind of said from of the people of God in Israel, Israel in Egypt. What do we read? And God saved Israel out of the land of the Egyptians, Exodus 14.30. But if he applied in a spiritual way, what does it mean for a child of God? Well, he is saved from eternal danger, rescued as it were. And he will be saved in future from his problem of his heart and all his sins. But salvation is not only the negative side, it's also a positive side. A giving of rest, a giving of peace, a giving of life. Think about the other example in scripture. Then you see the disciples in that storm, and the storm is almost casting the boat underwater. And then the Lord Jesus is on board, but they fear. They say, Lord, save us, we perish. And the Lord Jesus rebukes the wind, and it becomes a great calm. Well, that's exactly what saving also means. It brings rest, it brings peace. What does it mean for the child of God? Well, then no longer God is angry, but the anger has disappeared. And then they receive true life, and they receive an eternal joy and an eternal rest and peace. That's, by the way, why we read in Hebrews 4 and 9, there remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. But the question is, when does this saving work happen? Is it only in the past that it happened? Well, that's certainly true. For a child of God, that is certainly true. But this is not the answer. Is it maybe of the future that God will save them from their sins? Yes, one day that will be fully true. That's definitely the case. But the answer says He saves. That means He saves today, now. 
at this particular moment. Yes, the believer needs continually to be in Christ. That Christ prays always for him. If he wouldn't do it one second, dear friends, then the believer would fail and go into sin. But what does the Heidelberg Catechism now speak? What side does it speak of? Is it the negative side or is it more the positive side? Does it maybe say that he's safe from troubles? That's probably my like, that if you have a Savior, that he saves you from all the troubles in life and that you have a perfect life. But no. The Bible is very clear. The child of the Lord will have many troubles and many tribulations. Yes, even more, it says that he will be scarcely saved. You read in 1 Peter 4, 18. If the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall, shall the ungodly and sinner appear? So that's not the answer. What then? Is it maybe to save from eternal destruction? Oh, that's certainly true. And that's exactly what Ursinus writes about it in his commentary on this Lord's Day. But that's not the case here. It says, says from our sins. Why this? What is sin? Well, sin is actually the root issue. You can, you can compare it with a house and a foundation. If you have a cracks in your foundation, what will happen if you get storms? Well, the house will fall down. What do you need to do in order to save your house? You need to replace the house? No. You need to replace the foundation and then you have the house safe. And this is true for sins as well. The sin is the cracks in, in the foundation. Sin needs to be taken away. And then you can rebuild the house. The congregation, are we, have we been taught about the importance of the work of Christ? Why was his name given? Well, it was to save. What do we need to know? Well, why we need to be saved? May I ask you, myself as well, have we learned about that cracked foundation in our life? Have you learned about that boy that is drowning in the water, that we are like the same in sin? If that's not the case, dear friends, like the boy, if he wouldn't see that he's in the water, he would never ask to get out. Then we can continue to live as we want. At least so we think we can go to church, we can be a bit religious, we can talk about things of the Bible. We can even say, yes, sure, everyone needs Jesus Christ. I'm a sinner too, of course. But there's no sense of need. There's no urgency. Friend, if that's the case, it's not well with our soul. There needs to be an urgency in our life, or in the past, or now. Pray to the Lord. Lord, I don't feel anything. I don't know anything about this. I don't even want it. Give it to me, please. Be honest with the Lord. Turn also from your sin and turn to the Savior. Or have we learned that we were in trouble or are in trouble? And then we need to deliverance. Why? To solve the issues of my life? No. But that I'm drowning in my sin, that I fear, I fear for eternity, that I cannot die and I have to meet God. Well then, how can it ever be solved? Then the urgency comes in. And I feel the need of my salvation. And otherwise I'm drowning forever in God's dark night. And when that's realized, there are dark nights. There's so much cry out to God. God, help me and save me. I cannot stop crying until God saves me. And when the Lord then does not directly hear, then there is so much fear and doubt in my life. Will he ever hear? Am I not too sinful? Can I, did Christ come for me in my life? And even it gets more... Words when you hear about the text, if the righteous scarcely shall be saved, where shall the sinner appear? What about me? Can I then ever be saved? Is it then never for me? It seems to be more and more impossible if God shows these kind of texts, dear friends. And then there is many questions in my heart, many riddles. However, solve. But I cannot. But then to hear with the catechism, he saves. And there's a little hope. Then there is a way of salvation in him. Where is that found? 
Yes, in that little child that was born in Bethlehem, Jesus Christ. No, his name is not only because he saves, but also because there is no other source of salvation found in the world in any place but in him alone. And that's what we see further in answer 29. And likewise, because we ought not to seek, neither can find salvation in any other. There are two things that we can find here. First, there is an action going on. There is a seeking. But also, second, we can say there is a possibility of finding. What does it say about seeking? Well, we ought not to seek salvation in any other. What is seeking? How often do we not seek in our lives? Well, we seek something when we have lost something, let's say a key, or, or we need something. Then we seek a place, for example, of rest or whatever it is. Let's say you go with your whole family on a family trip. Five, ten kids. And then you go into the mountains and, and it's, a, it's a great journey. You, see, you enjoy the mountain, but so, suddenly you realize that one of the children is lost. What are you going to do? Just go on? No. You seek the child till you have found it. But the point is you need to seek it in the right place. Otherwise you will not find him. And what is seeking then in our verse, in our passage, that means to ask for, to strive after, to pray the Lord. And the Bible encourages to do that. It says, seek and thou shalt find, Matthew 7, 7. But not all seeking is true seeking. And that's why we find in Jeremiah 29, 13, ye shall seek me and find me when ye shall search for me with all your heart. It means we need to use all the means, all our time, all our effort to beg the Lord for an opening of heart. But what's now the problem in our answer? Do you know? The person might seek it at the wrong place. Not in Christ, but anywhere else. It's the same as the, the, the child in the mountain. Do you remember when you go with the family and the child's lost? And then you go home and you're going to seek for the child in the forest. Are you ever going to find the child there? Of course not. Why? Because you seek in the wrong place. You should seek it in the mountains, not in the forest. And here true. If you seek salvation in the wrong place, in the wrong spot, would you ever find it? No difference. The answer says, neither can we find salvation in any other. The previous passage said, where to seek? Seek me, said the Lord. Who is there speaking? It's the Lord. And the Bible is very clear. In Acts 4.12 it says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. But those that are seeking, can they find? Yes. What does that mean? Well, to find something that is lost, to find something that you recognize, discover that thing that is lost, and to get it again. It happens in our daily, daily lives as well. Maybe you were seeking for an hour for something you were lost that was very needed. And then finally you found it. You were so upset that you couldn't find it. And now suddenly you find it. What does happen? Well, it gives rest, it gives peace. Now that's exactly what happened with salvation. When it is found, there is found rest in him, as Christ says. Well, what is then sought? Is it riches? No. It is salvation. That means deliverance. It's eternal life. But let's draw a few lessons from this passage to our own lives. The first question we, we have to ask is this. Have we become seekers? Important question. The answer shows also that not everyone is a seeker. Maybe many do. But the answer says that it is seeking about salvation. It should become the most important thing of our life, dear friends. Maybe you think we should seek God's word, and, and yes, we should. Or we think if God wants to save me, then automatically He will do it. But is that what the Bible tells us? No. The Bible says to us, seek and ye shall find. Not those that just wait and do nothing. Let's not deceive ourselves, dear friends, 
with a thinking that God will not use the means. Don't expect God to work if we don't use the means. But another important question is this. Not only that we seek, but where do we seek? Is it in the world? Really? Do you not know what the Bible says about it, that the world will perish, that there is only death in the world? Or maybe you seek it in any religion. They will not save. Other gods, like other from other religions, do not even exist, dear friends. We know that from the scriptures. And even religion itself cannot save. He can go through the motions, but that will not save us, dear friends. Oh no. Is it maybe that we seek it with our frames and our tears and our Bible reading and whatever it is? Oh yes, it's important to have, but it's not what we need to seek for. Another question we might ask ourselves is, how do we seek? Or read the Bible with our head? Pray here, a quick Bible reading there? We need more, dear friends. Is it maybe just saw, uh, just very short, something you hear, people saying, yes, but I have sought the Lord, I couldn't find Him, the Lord didn't answer me. But what is often the issue? They didn't really seek. They sought the Lord for a very short time, maybe a week or so, and then they continued on, and they, they think the Lord is not hearing. But it's not the biblical way. The Bible says to seek with all your heart, and with half-heartedness. And the last question we can ask also is, is what are places if we seek we cannot find salvation? The answer for the Heidelberg Catechism is very clear. It's in any other but in Christ. And seekers in our midst are listening alone. If you seek, where do you seek? Is it with me, the Lord says? Or do you still seek it with yourself? You will never find it there. Oh no. And if the Lord does not break it off, everything we seek in anything else, we will be lost forever. The Lord doesn't allow for any saviors. Oh no. Maybe then repeat a couple of these questions to, to think about. The first question is, do we seek? Very important to answer. Second, do we seek salvation? Where do we seek? The third is, do we seek with our whole heart? Do we seek half-heartedly? And fourth, do we seek it only with the Lord? Or do we seek it in other places as well? We've now heard about the name Jesus. Important name. It's the Savior's name. But what is now his work? Well, that's our second point. It is about the Savior's work. And for this we go to question 30. Question 30, 30 says, Do such them believe in Jesus, the only Savior, who seek their salvation and welfare of saints, of themselves or anywhere else? In other words, those that seek salvation outside Jesus Christ, do they have true faith? It's a very important thing to think of. If we think about faith and, and belief, that, that's in our question. But what is to believe or what is faith? Well, that's to entrust to Jesus Christ, to have confidence in Him, to trust Him. Christ said, for example, in John 5, 46, For ye had, had ye believed Moses, ye would have believed me, for ye wrote of me. And does this not remind us of Lord's Day 7? What is true faith? Two things are mentioned there. Knowledge of the Bible, believing that all what the Bible says is true. But also in trusting with the heart. But what does the answer now say? To believe in Jesus Christ? No. Many might do. And that's what exactly what we find in John 2, verse 23 and 24. Many believed in his name, that's Christ's name, when they saw the miracles which he did. But Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men. He knew what was in their heart. What is the answer then? To believe in Jesus as the only Savior. That means it's the only way of salvation, the only mediator between God and man. But now there's a people that do not seek it only in him. Who are we talking about? Well, those that seek their salvation and welfare of saints, themselves, or anywhere else. 
You see, three different things are mentioned. First, saints. Second is by oneself. And third is in any other place than Christ. But what is a saint? Well, this particularly refers to the Roman Catholic Church. A lot of people in the Roman Catholic Church do pray to saints. They pray for sickness and for guidance to these saints. But what is a saint? Well, that's someone that's declared holy by the Roman Catholic Church. That might be a pope, but it can also be a biblical figure like Mary or Peter. But the Bible speaks very broad about a saint. The Bible would say it's everyone that truly believes that's a saint. So this, the word saint in itself is not wrong. Let's think about the second one. It's, it's seeking by oneself. That means you seek it in doing good things, in giving everyone that is due. Would God then reject me? That's often the question you hear in the world. I do so many good things in the world. Will God then reject me if I come before him? Or we have our feelings and our tears and our emotions and confessing of sin. I try to keep the law and it goes quite well. And a little outward sin. And of course I'm not denying salvation in Christ. But it's still Christ plus what I do. Maybe apply it to ourselves. Those that say to believe in Christ. How is it with other saviors? Do we have our saints? No, I don't say that. I don't believe that we worship saints like the Roman Catholic Church does. We don't ver- venerate Mary or, or Peter. Oh no, we are too reformed to do that. Of course not. So no saints? So we can skip this part of the question? Oh no, no. Wait a minute. The word saint in the Bible, as we said, is much broader. It's every true believer. Maybe we seek our salvation with that, that, that minister. If that minister is going to preach, then I will believe. Then I will be saved. But do I not make that specific minister my savior at that moment? The preaching is about the word of God, not about the minister itself. Even though there might be bonds with the minister. Or maybe you think about the child of God. If I go to this child of God and he prays for me, then God will definitely hear and God will save me. Oh, is that true? It is true that God hears the prayer of his people. And that oftentimes, sometimes back in the generations that a grandfather has prayed for his grandchildren and they will be saved in the line of generations. But it's not because the man prayed, but because God wants to use prayer as a means. You shouldn't find our salvation with any other saints, dear friends. Absolutely not. Or maybe we still seek it with ourselves in one way or another. No, we're not going to say as Reformed people that we that we can save ourselves, that, that we are too Reformed for that. But do we not in the deepest sense think these, these kind of things? Let me give two examples. How do we know? Well, then I feel so good when I can weep and when I can have tears and when I feel sin and when there's some opening in my prayer, when I can read my Bible. Then I'm so happy, but when it's not there, then I feel sad. The sandy ground. Oh yes, there are experiences in the life of God's people, definitely. But it's not the foundation, dear friends. God will never allow to build upon it. Or another thing in our lives that might be true as well. I'm so happy when I keep, can keep the law, when I can keep the Ten Commandments. And I feel so sad when I cannot. And if I can keep them, then I can pray to the Lord. And if I don't keep them, I then feel sinful. And I cannot pray anymore. Oh yes, we may feel bad about doing sin, of course. But do we not in the deepest sense of the word build on my law keeping? Based on my effort? God will not allow for this, dear friends. No. Or maybe we seek our salvation and welfare somewhere else. In the Roman Catholic Church, people pray often to, for sickness and, and guidance to the saints, do you remember? But where do we go with our sickness? Do we maybe trust only in a medical doctor? Do we only look to others in worldly wisdom for guidance? We seek it with advisors, influences, 
the politician, music stars, whatever you may mention, do we say that you may not go to a doctor? Do we say that you may not seek for some wisdom and advice? Of course. But how do we use it? Do we depend on them? Or do we pray the Lord and then seek for guidance? And those that are convicted of their sins, where do you seek it? Is it with the law? Don't you realize that law kills, as Paul writes, but the Holy Spirit gives life? Yes, the law can point to sin, but it can never save. But do you need that only Savior, Jesus Christ, and Him crucified? But what's now the answer that the Heidelberg Catechism gives? If those that seek it anywhere else, would they be able to find it in, in, in those places? And the answer says, they do not. For though they boast of him and words, yet indeed they deny Jesus the only deliverer and savior. They don't. The answer is no. Their mouth might be full of Christ, and even that they trust in him, but in the action they deny him. Yes, the catechism says they boast of him. It means they praise him, they glorify him. They might even say with an Isaiah, Cry out and shout, thou inhabitant of Zion, for great is the Holy One of Israel in the midst of thee. What a blessing if people say that or not. Or think about that one man that went to the temple. I thank thee, God, that I'm not like these others. What does Christ say about this man? The other one in the back that felt himself a sinner went home justified rather than this one that prayed so loud in the temple. Yes, they boast him in words. The trouble is not that they, they, they do praise God, but it is in words only. And that's what we see next. Because in deeds, they deny Jesus. It means in their practice. What does faith do? Well, it entrusts completely. But here, if you would seek it somewhere else, you do it half. You don't really trust Christ. You actually deny him with the deed. Eger says, the, he used kind of the same word. He was fearful for this denial of God. He said, lest I be full and deny thee and say, who is the Lord? That can happen, dear friends. Paul speaks about it in, in 2 Timothy 3, 5. He says, having the form of godliness, it seems to be all there. But he says, denying the power thereof. It looks great. They praise God. They have the mouth full. They speak of him. But their heart is not with it. And in the deepest sense, they deny Jesus as the only Savior. Congregation, do we see a difference between saying to believe and actual believing? There is a difference in reality. Some can speak so much about the Lord how great he is, how wonderful he is, how thankful they are for everything he gives in their life. And they are so sinful and so humble. It sounds great. And it can even move you to tears when you hear that story of their life. They have such a reverence for God. Or others, they praise Christ. He is such a savior. And do you not see what a work it was of him, that painful work on the cross? They have such a high value of this Jesus. But what do we need to look for? These words? No. We need to look for the deeds. How do they live? What do they do when they are in trouble? Where do they seek help? How does their prayer life look like? What do they pray? Is it only to thank the Lord? What sure? No, dear friends, there is a difference between a general sinner and a needy sinner. Let's listen to their talk as well. What do they talk about after the sermon? Is it about that great preacher in the sermon or is it about Christ that was preached? Is it maybe about the preacher or is it about the word of God that counts? The true believer is not interested in the sense about the minister. He's interested in about the work of the spirit by the minister. If the Spirit helps the ministry, he's satisfied. And if the Spirit doesn't, he is sad. 
Oh no, there can be a good sermon. There can be a biblical sermon. But the man had to do it himself. Let's look for that, dear friends. May I ask you and myself as well, what do our lives show? Do we praise Christ with the mouth and deny him indeed? And if we do, we speak about him. How? Is it from the heart? Or is it only from the head? And those that truly know the Lord. Oh yes, there can be such a struggle to find it all in Christ. Often myself is the issue. Then I seek it again with others. But isn't that not true, dear friend? Those that have true faith have a complete Savior and everything in Him. Because answer 30 continues. For one of these things must be true, that either Jesus is not a complete Savior, or that they who by a true faith receive the Savior must find all things in Him necessary for their salvation. There's two options. And the first one is that those that seek their salvation partially or fully elsewhere. That means they don't find everything in Christ. It says either Jesus is not a complete Savior. It's not perfect. There's something lacking. Maybe 80%, 90%, maybe 95 or 99, but not 100. And you can think about a mortgage if you want to buy a house. I don't know how it is exactly in the States. I know in the Netherlands you would have to bring some of your own money when you want to have that. Yes, the, the bank can pay for, let's say, thousands of dollars, but at least you need to bring 10%. And then the bank will pay the rest, so you can pay the debt of the house. Is that how Christ works? No. Then Christ will be an incomplete Savior. If Christ is all what is needed for salvation, why would you seek it somewhere else? What is the advantage? It shows if someone seeks it anywhere else, it is not all in Christ. Or is missing something. Think about this. Let's say you have a very large store in, here in town. And the store has everything you need. Price-wise, product-wise. Why would you go somewhere else? If you would go somewhere else, that means there's something lacking. Maybe it's a traveling distance. Maybe it's the price. Maybe it's some product that is missing. But if this store has everything you need... Why do you need to go somewhere else to find it? And the same is true for Christ. If you seek it outside him in what way it is, you are not safe, the catechism says. But are there then some that do have? Yes. That's our second option. Those that have Christ have all in him. All that is needed for salvation. The answer says... They who by a true faith receive the Savior must find all things in Him necessary for their salvation. Literally says they have all things or they possess all things. They get the inheritance by Him. The Bible says, ye are complete in Him. Colossians 2.10 What kind of things? All necessary for salvation. That means nothing more is needed, needed to be saved. Everything that was required of God is found in Christ. It's the same as you would enroll in a certain program, let's say in college or university. You know the curriculum. You know the program. If I do this, this, and this, and I get all these courses done, then I can graduate. Can this school require you to do something else, what was not in the program? No. This is what you discussed. And if you do this, you are able to graduate. They cannot solely add something else to it. You know, the same is true with Christ. He has paid everything that was needed for salvation. And now the Father is satisfied. But it also means that everything with Christ is found in Him. And child of the Lord, may I ask you, how was it when Christ was revealed? When you fled with all your need to Him, was not much strife. How would He receive me? Am I not too wicked for him? Am I not too, too sinful for him? And then you couldn't go but empty-handed. As I am. Oh yes, I had to learn so much. And then God had to break down all my other saviors and that's painful. And then I couldn't find it anywhere else. I had nowhere to go but to Christ. 
What did you then find? Everything needed for salvation. He paid for sin. Each and every single sin. He sanctifies me completely, fully. No, that's not my own working. It's His. He gives out of mere grace. And then He also prays for me in that heavenly place with the Father that His children might come home. What a wonder of grace. But my uncle for the friend here are listening along. Now, here we can say that you have everything in Christ. You not only deny with the words, most likely, but also in the deeds that he is not a complete savior. You despise him. You seek it with others. But it will never help you, dear friend. May the Lord show you that your only wickedness in self, that you've only filthy rags. Then you seek it truly with the savior. If it's from the Holy Spirit, then he will find that you find it all in him. That doesn't mean we're not using the means. It doesn't mean that we don't read the Bible. Absolutely. But never think that God hears me because I pray. Dear friends, this sermon was about the name Jesus. His importance. It's work. And as we said at the beginning, names have meaning. They are important. What meaning? What importance has the name Jesus to us? Is it simply a word in the Bible? Or for some, dear friends, it's a very precious name. They can spell it out as it were. Others do despise it like the Jewish people. When they hear that name, they spit on him. But for us, it needs to receive importance, dear friends. Why? Because he saves from sin. And the question to us is, will he save me? Or will I perish? Let's go home with that question and think about it and ask God to impress these matters upon our hearts. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, and we come before thee after the service and the sermon to ask thee for blessing and help in all things. Thou hast given to speak thy word about the name Jesus Christ. May it become a name of very importance in our lives. Show us why it is needed, or show us more the need for him. Go with us in this day, also when we go home, protect us over unsafe roads, and bring us back next week in thy favor. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We will now sing Psalter 120, the stanzas 1 and 2. Judge me, O God, of my salvation. Plead my cause, for thee I trust. Hear my earnest supplication. Save me from my foes unjust. 1 and 2, and what follows of 120.
May the grace of Christ the Savior and the Father's boundless love with the Holy Spirit's favor rest, above, uh, rest upon us from above. Amen. Doxology is my 97, both senses. for some answers and question time. 